Thanks, Drew. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today on behalf of Gazira, the Gas Industry Social and Environmental Research Alliance. Uh, that's a collaborative vehicle initiated by Australia Pacific LNG and CSIRO to collaboratively explore the social and environmental challenges and opportunities arising from gas developments. Uh, you can find out about more, more about Gazira at its website. The French film director uh, Jean-Luc Godard was once asked if he could confirm the proposition that a story had a start, a middle and an end. And being a very helpful chap, he said, certainly, but not necessarily in that order. Uh, I'm not a French film director, and so I'm actually going to take you through a very linear uh, exploration of the intersections between coal seam gas, agriculture and water. Why are we talking about gas? Australia and the world's energy use continues to rise. Australia's energy use goes up by about 2% per annum, and that of the globe goes up 5% per annum. That increase in demand is occurring at the same time as Australia and other countries are seeking to cost-effectively transition to a low-carbon economy. Coal seam gas has a role to play there because it is more cost-effective than renewable sources of energy at present and is likely to remain so for several decades. It's also a less greenhouse gas intensive means of producing electricity than coal, offering greenhouse gas savings of between 15 and 50% under most circumstances. Australia has large quantities of coal seam gas. It has proven and probable reserves of 28,000 petajoules which is enough to meet all of the nation's electricity needs for 11 years. It's proven, probable and possible reserves, 300,000 petajoules, are enough to meet all of Australia's electricity generation needs for 120 years, or to meet the, the currently rising needs for 62 years, that is taking into account current demand growth. The fourth point is that global demand for LNG is rising, so the gas industry represents a significant trade opportunity for Australia. So that's why we're talking about gas. Why are we talking about the intersection of coal seam gas and agriculture? The intersection of the agricultural and gas industries is increasing at an unprecedented pace and it's introducing lots of new neighbours in large numbers for the first time. So there's a many new experiences and lessons to be learnt by both parties. The coal seam gas industry is going to intersect with a range of agroecological zones, most particularly the slopes and plains to the west of a region that extends from Newcastle to Mackay. 90% of the 3P reserves exist in Queensland. So in terms of potential industry intersections, so that red area is where the, is where the proven and probable reserves are, we can expect to see intersection of agriculture and coal seam gas in a, in a number of agroecological zones. I'll now just step through a number of Australia's important agricultural industries and we'll look at the intersection of those industries with coal seam gas. The gas industry will intersect some of the more dense sheep production zones in Australia, particularly in the border region of Queensland and New South Wales. The darker spots there show the more dense areas of beef production in Australia. The gas industry will intersect some of the more dense beef production areas, particularly in central Queensland. The dark areas there show the areas of more intensive irrigation in Australia. The gas industry will intersect with some of those, particularly in northern New South Wales, southern Queensland and central Queensland. Moving on to the grains industry the three grain production zones of Australia, the gas industry will significantly intersect 
the northern grain zone, which is responsible for about 25% of Australia's grain production. And finally, horticulture. The gas industry will also intersect significant areas of annual and perennial horticultural production. This map shows perennial <coughs> horticulture. Again, the darker areas, more dense production. So that shows the intersection of the industries at a large scale. What can we expect to see at a smaller scale? How much land will they actually share? It's not possible to know that with precision, partly because the rate and eventual scale of the industry isn't set in concrete. So we'll look at two scenarios, one in which the number of gas wells is limited by the capacity to actually put them in the ground, and another situation where the number of gas wells will be limited by the ultimate scale of the industry. So first, looking at limitation according to the capacity to establish wells. If we assume that it's not possible to establish more than 750 wells in a year, <coughs> and we accept that wells will last for 15 to 25 years, that means wells will come in and out of production over a 50-year period, let's say. As those wells com come in and out of production, using these assumptions, 750 wells a year lasting 15 to 25 years, it means at any given point in the gas industry's development, we could expect to see a maximum of 11, about 11 to about 19,000 wells in the ground at any one time. If each well occupies about 2% of the landscape when it's in operation, that translates to between 13 to 21,000 hectares of farmland that will be directly alienated by um, gas infrastructure occurring on that land. If we then look at a situation where the number of wells is determined by the ultimate scale of the industry, and we have an industry that reaches the estimated Queensland size of about 50 million tonnes per annum, that translates to about 2,800 petajoules. The average production per gas well over the last few years has been 0.13 petajoules per well. Divide one by the other and you end up with about 20,000 wells required to produce about 50 million tonnes of gas each year. Now when, a, a, when gas infrastructure is being established in the landscape, it takes up about 5% of the landscape and when it moves from establishment into operation, it drops from about 5% to about 2%. So that gives us figures of 24 to 59,000 hectares that we could expect to be alienated by uh, the presence of gas infrastructure in the farm landscape. I've seen um, unsubstantiated, that doesn't mean incorrect, it just means unsubstantiated, uh, estimates of 40,000 wells existing. I think that's probably an estimate for the whole uh, life state of the whole industry rather than the number that will be there at any point in time. If you really like a figure of 40,000 at any point in time, please just double the figures you see at the bottom. So what might that degree of intersection at the soil surface mean for agricultural production? It probably means that the impacts of agricultural production will be seen more at a local than at a national scale. So to wrap some numbers around that, if we assume that all of the land alienated by gas infrastructure is prime agricultural land, and I think that we've seen that not all of it is, lost production as a direct result of land alienation would total about 0.16% of the national grain crop. That's assuming the national grain crop of about 40 million tonnes and an average yield of about 2.5 tonnes a hectare. Of course, intersections between the gas industry and the agricultural industries aren't simply confined to the soil surface. Uh, I'm sure you will have heard that there's discussion about the intersection of water resources. 
I'll just take you through some of these. One of the difficulties uh, that exists when trying to discuss uh, water resources and the intersection between the gas industry and agriculture is that frequently it's looked at at very different spatial scales, meaning that we're comparing apples and pineapples, really. I've tried to reduce the geographical scale to a common unit, the Surat Basin, where uh, the larger part of the development is going to occur. When we do that, uh, gas industry water extraction is likely to be of the order of 75 to 140 gigalitres per year in the Surat Basin. Existing agricultural water use in the same area is about 140 gigalitres. So the, the gas industry may uh, add 50% or may double existing water extractions for a period of time in the Surat Basin. If we look at the whole industry, uh, it may remove 90 to 320 gigalitres of water per annum across the nation. Going back to the Surat Basin, again looking at intersections, the gas industry may put in about 11,000 to 21,000 bores. Agriculture currently in the Surat Basin, agriculture and related industries, have about 12,000 bores there. And here's where we start to get into some differences. What does water mean to these two industries? For the gas industry, water is largely a byproduct. They actually seek to minimise their exposure to water because it comprises 60% of the costs of gas production. That contrasts greatly with the agriculture industry in which water is a precious resource. So precious, in fact, that irrigation enables less than 1% of our agricultural land to produce about one-third of the national value of farm produce. So it helps us to understand why there are differing attitudes to water in these industries. An another difference between uh, approaches to water is that uh, for the gas industry, uh, water extraction uh, doesn't need to be included in catchment management plans, whereas for the agricultural industry, uh, it does. 